Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm Professor Bob Boland. Uh, you probably, or most everyone in the audience probably knows me. Uh, I am possibly suited for this because I teach a very optimally timed class in collective bargaining and labor relations in sports, uh, and also a class in uh, sports negotiations. So uh, my timing to have this program probably couldn't be better. Uh, I am uh, surrounded by some of the most extraordinary people in, uh, in the business and the veteran of about 60 combined years in uh, covering, working, and being around sports and the labor conflicts in sports. So my hope is that we have the most extraordinary panel that could be, could be found and ones with no particular current axe to grind so we can get to some analysis today. Uh, my, my other hope is, and I, I want to say this, I think this is going to be a wonderful program for the Tisch Center. Uh, if you're new to us, the Preston Robert Tisch Center for Hospitality, Tourism, and Sports Management is the, is the sports business and sports management educational wing of, uh, of NYU. And uh, I'm joined by uh, four members of our adjunct faculty today. We are four members of our faculty, Wayne McDonald, who's a member of our full-time faculty, Michael Lombardi, and uh, Frank Hawkins, who are members of our adjunct faculty. And let me begin by thanking our dean, Bjorn Hansen, for uh, helping make this event or giving us permission to have this wonderful event and giving it his full, the full weight of his support. I'd like to thank our wonderful event staff, um, Rakesh Malik, who's here today, and Suzanne Stevenson, who uh, has worked on this, and Ro Biscardi, who's worked on this very, very hard and, and done an amazing job in putting this together. And I'd like to thank my colleagues on the Tisch Center uh, faculty for helping uh, coordinate this event and put it together. And obviously, you as students, you as friends, and you are, who are here, uh, we're very thrilled that you can join us today. I'm going to ask our panelists, uh, starting with Professor McDonald, to introduce themselves in about about one minute very briefly, and it will give us two things. It'll let us test our microphones, and uh, if there's a technical problem, we can work it out, and uh, just tell briefly what, what, who they are and why they're here. Thanks, Professor Bolin. Hi, everyone. I think you know who I am. I'm Professor Wayne McDonald, uh, full-time faculty in the Tisch Center. And for those of you who don't know, I, I study the business of baseball. I know a, a thing or two about the sport, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks, and thanks, uh, thanks, Professor, for having, having me here. Great pleasure. I'm uh, John Wertheim. I'm a writer at uh, Sports Illustrated, do some work for uh, CNN, cover a variety of sports and sports business, and uh, no, I, my, my membership is cryogenically frozen in the New York bar. I am, uh, I'm a licensed attorney, so uh, I have a, you know, a labor law angle as well. Thanks. I'm Frank Hawkins. Um, I'm now a consultant doing mostly media work, but I spent 15 years at the NFL, mostly under Commissioner Tagliabue and two years under Commissioner Goodell. And uh, one cannot work at the NFL without becoming intimately involved in uh, labor relations. So uh, uh, I ended up authoring large chunks of the last CBA that uh, um, now uh, everyone thinks is a horrible deal. <laughs> <laughs> It is impenetrable, but I don't know that it's horrible. Uh, I'm Charles Grantham, uh, former director of the NBA Players Association, and I have uh, represented uh, players as a collective and also individually, and I'm here to add some balance to this. <laughs> and I'm Michael Lombardi. I was in the NFL for 23 years, and now I uh, talk about football on NFL Network and write a column for NFL.com and teach a class with Bob Bolin, who I appreciate having me here. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll, we'll go over one ground rule that, that, that I, we're all on a first name basis. We're all pretending we're having the most intimate discussion of this in a place that might have better beverages somewhere, uh, as, as people would about sports and sharing our, and sharing our, our relative, uh, our relative uh, experience. So we're on a first name basis. We are free to interrupt one another and have it as open a conversation. John, I'm going to pose the first question to you. And, because you're not really from a, from a particular bent on this one. What's the state of labor relations in the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball? All collective bargaining agreements expire in 2011. Give us a brief rundown on where we are from your point of view. Well, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, some are further in the negotiation process than others. And in some ways, this is collective bargaining 101. You've got union. You've got management. We're talking about dividing a pie. I mean, I, I think what strikes me as, as the big difference right now is where the NFL is as a business and where the profitability is and the fact that you've got this 
league that's coming off this just incredibly successful season. It's on this great run in a much different place than the NBA and, and even to a lesser extent baseball. So I think the, what makes the NFL unique to me when I talk about it with, with groups is just you've got this wildly profitable business, really only one way to go up. And we sort of, the, the cliche is killing the golden goose or is this the time to really take apart this deal? But I think it's unique to have this collective bargaining at this, at this stage. The NBA is a little different where you've got a little more transparency and it's clear this is not in the position of profitability than, than the NFL is. So the NBA deal, which we haven't heard a whole lot about because the NFL has really sort of filled the vacuum right now just because of timing, but I think the NBA situation is in some ways more interesting because you don't have this profitability. And, and that deal expires on June 30th with Major exactly. League Baseball coming up on December 5th. Uh, so going in, a, going in that state. Gentlemen, is there anything else that, that, that Mr. Wertheim didn't say that you'd like to add to that question as we go? Well, I think I'd like to add that uh, <clears throat> By all facts and by all uh, reports of revenue and the generation of revenue, that all the leagues are prosperous. And that um, if you look at it from a player's perspective, and that's how they would, would view this thing, is that uh, each year attendance goes up, each year the TV deals are more lucrative, and each year the uh, gross revenue of all the leagues have been up. Now, whether or not they're profitable, uh, can we take a good look at the expenses? There's always going to be that dispute as to whether you're successful or not. And quite frankly, at this day and age, if you look at just the revenue numbers, all four sports would be deemed profitable or successful. Wayne? I guess that the key thing when you look at with regard to baseball, you're talking about a $7 billion sport right now with 12 teams on opening day that had in excess of a $100 million payroll, plus the commissioner of the sport saying, we want 80 million people coming to games this year. Now, you're not hearing a lot about the MLB CBA because it doesn't expire till December, but it's showing that there's optimism in terms of massive revenue accumulations in the sport. Frank, you've been on the management side of this, and, and, and management everywhere is not painting such a rosy picture. How do you explain that, or is it explainable? It's collective bargaining. Um, <laughs> look, um, the problem that you've got here is that um, Charles has quickly gone to the player's classic argument. Top line is going up, therefore things are healthy. There are expense issues. And more than that, you've got some really interesting constituencies on both sides. These are multi-employer bargaining units. They aren't identically situated. Um, and um, the salary cap, by definition, works off an average team. As long as the top to bottom curve is within some reasonable um, uh, range, um, a salary cap works reasonably well. When it gets out of whack in terms of the top to bottom curve, you've got real issues. Um, and some of those are driven by the players, some of those are internal to management, um, and uh, they need to be worked through. Frank, we'll come back to you on that question in a second. Uh, Michael, on, on the team side, what, what is, is the, health of, the health of the individual franchises that strong right now? Well, you know, it's like any other business. It's how you manage your own team. And I think that the collective bargaining agreement that we had in the past was at least allowed the ground rules and the framework where teams could make money. And I think the dispute lies in how much money they actually can make. And I think it, it goes back to how you manage your team, how much front office you have. And I think the other issue is the rising cost. And I know this is something we all don't want to talk about is health care and all the other auxiliary things that an owner has to, has to absorb when he is dealing with players, whether it's worker comp claims and those other factors that we don't see in the bottom line. We only see player cost and we see coaching cost. Charles, I cut you off because you were going to say something else. Go well, ahead. The bottom line in all this happens to be trust. And if, in fact, the players don't trust the owners, then clearly they make a very solid argument, and that is that please let me analyze the financial uh, books with you, and then we can help determine whether or not you're uh, spending money uselessly or whether or not you're misappropriating funds or whether or not you're actually running a very efficient business or not. So on the one hand, once you decide you want to be uh, a revenue share with the players, you now formed sort of a awkward but yet a real partnership. And if, in fact, you want to promote that as a partnership, then let's all look at this as a problem and solve the problem together. Uh, what you often have, however, is that you've got two different warring bodies 
who simply are at this point greedy. Okay, whether it's players or owners, today you're looking at anywhere from five to twelve billion dollars, depending on what sport you're 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 analyzing. And there clearly is enough money to go around. The question is who gets the majority share? Uh, the business problems themselves can be resolved. The problem is that many of the leaders that you see today are not really interested in solving the problem, but winning the battle. Well, that's actually a great point, and it leads us to the next question. We have, le the law has sort of set us up in this way. We have an adversarial system of labor relations and sports because the sports unions provide enormous antitrust protection to the, monopol the monopoly owners of the leagues. In no other business do unions have that implicit power that they have in sports. Is that correct? Is that why we're in this adversarial situation? Well, I think so. My experience goes back to the 90s when we continued to chase, you know, when does this labor exemption to the antitrust law expire? And at that point, there was really no, I think, finite definition. But once it was determined that by decertifying the union, you can then therefore strip management of its antitrust protection, then that became a bargaining chip and became a strategy by which they would employ, or the players would employ, to gain leverage at the table. And I, clearly, that's where you are today in the NFL. We're precisely there because, because decertification became a weapon of labor. Now, that's an unusual weapon, right? If the Teamsters went out of business uh, for a trucking company, there wouldn't be any, any fight over that. That's correct. And, and it, it, it became a strategy because there was one point when you could go to management and say, guess what? I don't agree to those anti-competitive restraints any longer. And they will say, good luck, because uh, you didn't have that uh, particular escape of decertifying the union. Now, I think it's kind of shifted back to, or not shifted back, but it's shifted to the point where the labor really has a, a piece that they can use to, uh, to balance the playing field. So, so just for the sake of the audience, we have, we have in sports a number of, we, we, we started with, the, with the, the, basically the, the canvas that all the sports leagues are essentially monopolies. They, they don't have a, a, ne a necessary competitor on the American continent. They're made up legally from the American needle case of competitors who have to cooperate to have roster limits, to have a draft, to share revenue, to share TV money. They need to have some exemption that allows them to get around the antitrust laws. John, were you going to add to that in any way? Yeah, I mean, no, I, think that's, I think that's important to point out, that this is a very unique, you know, I think a lot of unions and a lot of labor organizations are looking at these negotiations, but it's very unique. There's not a salary cap among truckers. Most unionized jobs, you don't have these athletes who have the potential to make eight figures, and that in some ways you need some of these, uh, you need some of these constraints. So I, I think I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's important to point out that while it's instructive to look at this through a collective bargaining prison, this is a very unique dynamic that we have going on with these people, workers basically who have one in a million skills. Right. I mean, in in the sense that there are Wisconsin, there was Wisconsin state senators hiding out to maintain the collective bargaining rights. Of their, of their public employees in, in, in Illinois. They, they were in the wrong state at the time to avoid the bills being passed. That's not a threat right now in, in pro sports. The unions are, are important, at least from uh, the, the perspective of making the deals work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, these are the most power. Absolutely, yeah. So interestingly enough, we have a union that's given up its collective bargaining rights and in, 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 in claim that they're no longer a union. What advantage do they achieve by doing that? Well, I mean, the, the major advantage is that you will probably get some edge in the uh, negotiations because the day following you decertify is the, the same day that you identify five or six or eight plaintiffs who will file antitrust lawsuits against the league. And those antitrust lawsuits uh, potentially carry triple damages. So that puts you in a framework, I think, to get a deal done at some point. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely gives them a, a, an advantage. Michael? But, but the reality is, is that it has to still be negotiated out. That, 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 that lawsuit's never going to come to fruition, because if they do, it could destroy the league, essentially. What well, it do. has come to fruition before. And in fact, uh, the football players did win their uh, free agency as a result of that. Right, which so, was in 87, when we, they fought for it, which was ultimately the right thing to do. And then the league made things worse by putting Plan B but in. But at that time, they could have just as well chose not to have a salary cap. 
But they did. They did choose to have a salary cap because they felt it was in the best interest of the business to generate the kind of revenue that would pay the players. So now if you move forward to today, you've got a similar problem, but now they just want a bigger, better fact. The players, if I see it in football, aren't asking for a bigger piece of the pie. They're just asking to maintain status quo. Right. On a deal that, you know, that was delayed without seeing the books and it was made in Dallas after many extensions where, you know, it was one of those things where it was a deal that they had to make to keep the, the league flowing and moving and it wasn't everybody in the room, I don't think, really understood the magnitude of the deal at the time. And as they look back on it and reflected back, I don't think they're comfortable with where the deal led them to, especially when the, we never cleared up the rookie salaries. Which of course, was, of course uh, you know, again, I'm here arguing the player's point of perspective here, but no one would believe that. Well, no, no one would believe that they didn't understand the ramification of the deal they signed and that they negotiated. I, I'm well, gonna I've been in a few owners' <laughs> meetings, yeah. and I can honestly <laughs> say, as Frank has, yeah. I, I can honestly Look. say, I think sometimes you need to wake them up. That, that, I, I think illeg illegally, I used to say this to Mr. Modell when I worked for him, I think you need legal <laughs> counsel every time you go in here because some things can happen that you're really not in tune with. I mean, when you bring 32 of those older guys in a room, I think this stuff kind of goes over their head. Yeah, actually, you know, the one thing that was fascinating about the 2006 negotiation is they didn't vote on a negotiated deal. Essentially what happened is that uh, the union walked away from the negotiations um, management then called union, the union back and wanted to resume before the Monday meeting in Dallas. And Upshaw's bottom line was, okay, I will give you a term sheet. You vote it up or down. And that's what he did. Uh, I and I will tell you that it was the right decision at that time, but there were some landmines buried in there that even we at, uh, on the staff who were working on it did not understand. Well, that brings us into a great question right now, and, and, and I'm sorry, Charles, to, to, to stop you. you. You guys have brought up two things, and I, I wanted to get into both of them. The first one is that the two men in the middle of the table are two of the people that, that put salary caps into effect in, in, in sports, and, and we'll go there in a second. The question I think we, we're on right now is the politics of the constituencies. Can you, and all of you have been in on this, Frank, can you talk about the politics of the owner's constituency a little bit? Um, the politics of the owner's constituency changes over time, and right now it is a very entrepreneurial constituency, uh, by and large, um, and uh, I think that um, there is a focus on top-line growth um, that hasn't necessarily been there all along. Um, You've got teams in very different markets. You've got teams in very different stadium situations. And things move fairly quickly. But, uh, you know, it's grouped into the high revenue clubs, the average revenue clubs, and a few um, uh, who are at the low end of the spectrum. And I think that what's interesting about this deal is it's got to work for the average guys and yet you could end up with, um, in essence, a left-right coalition, which we had seen in Washington on a couple of issues um, that were broadcast-related, where you know the anti-indecency folks got together with the First Amendment absolutists and ended up voting down yeah. sensible reforms. Um, you could end up with a high-revenue, low-revenue coalition that makes it extremely difficult to get a deal done, even though for the average, it works well. Frank, let me ask you one clarifying question. Give us examples of, of, of what, what, it, what, what kind of top line revenue are you talking about here, just for a layman? What, what are examples of that? Um, just top line revenue that they are trying to grow the growth in gross as opposed to necessarily the growth in net. So the, the, the size of the overall pie. Size of the overall pie. Um, a lot of that growth definitely comes at a cost in terms of expenses to generate revenues. I mean, think of 1987. 1987, how many real private stadiums were there the last time that you had a work stoppage? One. Okay? Now there's probably 15 that are real private stadiums and another 10 
where the team does the lion's share of um, driving the revenue in the stadium. So the culture is really a lot different than it was the last time around. And a lot of the owners have come in since the last labor stoppage, so they don't really, I think, yet have a good feel for all of the stuff that's going to come down on their heads. John? Yeah, just, just real quick, I think that goes to the point of these sort of these strange bedfellows, that it's very hard to uh, handicap which owners are going to be, sort of how, how hard line certain owners are going to be, because a, a small market owner may have interests aligned with a large market owner who's carrying, a, you know, got to do some pretty significant debt service. So I think that sort of added a wrinkle where the factions are not particularly obvious. At least. I don't know if, Michael, you agree with that, but it's, it's not as though the five owners of the smallest market teams are in one corner and the Patriots, you know, Knicks, you know, J Jets, Giants, and Cowboys are in the other. Yeah, because I think ultimately you can win and you can make a profit in the league if your organization structurally is fairly well. I mean, Paul Allen's money doesn't buy him a championship. And, you know, I, I think that's where the NFL and I think that's where the solution to the labor dispute really lies is because the NFL is moving closer to where there's only about 10 players on each team that are really, really worth the amount of money that they get. The other ones are replaceable parts. And if you have somebody the way the New England system operates, those replaceable parts, the salaries get too high, somebody else pays for them, and you bring somebody young in, and it's a little bit of the money ball principle, but the reality of it is, is with a cap, it's, if you manage it correctly, it's tough to spend all the way up if you have a good team. The advantage of the cap is it forces some of the owners to spend money. In the last cap, it would last year, some owners didn't have to spend the minimum, which significantly hurts the league. Charles? Well, let's, let's start, let's go back a minute. The, the, the reality is that it was the owners who suggested a salary cap and revenue sharing to the players. Players didn't come in and say, we'd like to have a salary cap or we'd like to have revenue sharing. So this was a well thought out procedure, process, business plan. Um, now, from day one, when we signed the first collective bargaining agreement with the salary cap, it was clear that my job was to make sure there were enough exceptions to that cap that would allow the players still to enjoy a relatively good free agent marketplace for their skills. On the other side, it was clearly the uh, responsibility of the commissioner to his owners was to make sure that he minimized those exceptions and minimize labor costs. At a time we then can determine new sources of revenue, generating new sources, and make as much money as we possibly can as a league. The fact that at the end of the day, at the end of the five or six years of the collective bargaining agreement, that we would then like to change or modify that system, clearly again is a management generated idea. The players typically are in the position of trying to maintain the status quo. John? Actually, I do have one question for you. We've talked about managing the internal constituency at the, on the management side. You had just as hard a job as Roger Goodell when you were managing the internal constituency on the union. Could you? Well, it's, there's no question that uh, your responsibility as either one of the leadership is to uh, build a consensus with the group and then determine which direction and what strategy you would employ. Um, it's very difficult because um, I would say all the time to David uh, Stern that, look, you, you have an easy job. You've got 30 <laughs> astute businessmen that you can sit in a room and talk about a strategy to create a new collective bargaining agreement. I've got 400 players who have 400 agents who all have a different agenda. And that becomes the big challenge. Can you get enough of a consensus among your, your players that will drive an agenda. And that is not easy. That's the hardest part about the NFL is there is so many agendas. I mean, there is so, there's so many layers to let's eliminate the rookie pool, but then all of a sudden we take away the, the, the agent's ability to make 3%. Now agents of the NBA only ha make money on the second contract. They don't make money on the first, whereas everybody in the NFL is scared to death about our having a system, even though they understand that Sam Bradford shouldn't make $55 million. Yeah, that, but that's, oh, but we've also seen it in baseball with, from the perspective of when Marvin Miller really came into the picture in the late 1960s, he was the galvanizing force before the players that now they had this voice. They can actually go after 
management and, and the realization was that management had a lot of cracks in the armor and they finally had someone that can actually get in there for them and start to bring issues like deferred compensation and interest and all these things into the equation that were never brought before. Well, you often find that, it, and we keep coming back to it, but it's, it's balance. I mean, the question is, can you balance a, a, a deal? And as you go to more caps, it becomes more difficult to balance. So you go to a rookie weight scale, which minimizes what individual agents can earn, and clearly they will begin politicking with their players to prevent such an imposition. So you have to be very careful when you start talking about a salary cap because now you're saying if there's a cap on salaries, and as a matter of fact, if there's a cap based on uh, user service uh, and, and experience, then guess what? The agent is put in a place where he can't charge a fee. Well, he can't charge a fee, then he's going to rattle the cage with regard to the players that he represents and therefore it makes it very difficult at the bargaining table to say, you know what, guys, we think a w rookie weight scale is a good idea. See, that's yeah. a great point because what we're going to see in the upcoming MLB uh, negotiations is the slotting fee. Now, th now this past uh, draft in 2010, we saw 17 out of the 32 players that were selected in the first round go above slot. And where do you come off telling a player you can't make five and a half million dollars because you got drafted fifth overall, you can only make four million. But then you see it from the league perspective that, you know, you're giving a high school kid six and a half million dollars and he was drafted 28th overall in, in the draft and he's making more than the first overall pick. So there, there has to be that, that medium that you can reach to where there's some type of balance because either way it can really take it in different directions. Well, You've alluded to it, but without, without so much saying it, is, is one of the major problems of 2011 is that the salary cap system isn't working as efficiently as it once did and it needs to be readjusted in, in basketball and, and, and football? Well, I think the revenue sharing concept is a good one for professional sports. The debate and the fight becomes where the limitations are placed. And I happen to believe that the, you know, the, the, the draft itself uh, establishes a weight scale. So the question is, do you need a scale within a scale? And usually players are offended by that scale within a scale because if in fact I come out and I'm the Heisman Trophy winner and I'm the best thing since post toasties coming into the league, uh, why shouldn't I be able to bargain uh, like the president of the team bargains for his salary? Uh, so you, you really have to look at um, uh, how you disperse that, quote, draft and where you place the limitations. And, and the whole concept of the rookie pool really wasn't the player's fault how it got to where it is today because the agents became shrewder than the negotiators and put option clauses in and escalators and all of a sudden this little little ball started rolling into this incredibly difficult problem and then the NFL always has the rule, well, if the team ahead of you did it, you have to do it. And if you want to win, you better do it. And Red McCombs tried to not do it, and he almost got killed because Bryant McKinney held out for forever. And so he had to eventually give in to that deal. So the, really, the rookie pool is more of the club's fault than it is the agent's fault, really. The agents are just more shrewder negotiators. I, I agree. And usually <laughs> you find that the players are most offended, but as to why we should litigate or legislate something that will protect you against yourself. You know, baseball doesn't have a salary cap. They have a luxury tax system, and, and we're always kind of looking at how things work a little differently. Uh, and, and football and basketball have, have a salary cap system, which also comes with a salary floor, a minimum spend in each sport. Maybe the great contribution of Bill Belichick to our society is that he's taught all the other owners how to, how to spend less and win more to a degree. There are a lot of teams right now saying they'd like to be under the salary floor if they could. If we could we, they, they don't want cap relief anymore. They're looking for floor relief. Are we in a system where a luxury tax system where teams could be free to spend what they want would be a better system for the sports? We're talking. I mean, I, you know, you could make the case the luxury tax is, in a sense, a, a, a form of cap. I was talking to Marvin Miller a few weeks ago. Still, he's 94 years old and still going strong and filled with opinions. And he, he basically said if he had to be completely truthful and a salary cap was on the table, he'd have to go to his constituents and say, look, the owners want to pay you more, but for the benefit of everybody, I'm going I'm to reduce your wages. I'm going to take the step of cutting down your wage. He said if, if any union, if he were ever in a union that 
had a salary cap, he would seek to decertify uh, that union. And I, I mean, I think the luxury tax that um, you know we don't hear much about in baseball has the effect of depressing wages. But you look at baseball, and I, I mean, I think from an outsider perspective, I, th I think it, it really does not do a service to the overall sport when you have one team that can spend six times as much as the other on wages. And I, you know, they can the Pittsburgh Pirates can make their profit and players will get paid, but I, I don't see it as something positive to the overall health of a sport when players on one team can make wages that are multiples times another one. I, I think we have to look a little bit deeper here. Uh, from the surface, yes, you look at the Yankees, you look at a $210 million payroll on opening day, but look at what the luxury tax goes for in baseball. It goes for the industry growth fund. It goes to player benefits. And granted, you, your biggest offenders are the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Angels, and the Tigers. The Yankees put $192 million into the luxury tax from 2003 to 2010. But that money is being reinvested in the sport to help players, to help grow the overall sport, not just nationally, but internationally. So there is some value and benefit to it. But $178 million luxury tax threshold this year, there's only one team that's blowing it, and that's the Yankees. Right. I, I still think it's, it's rough for a sport. I mean, one of the huge virtues of the NFL, as I see it, is just you have this parity, and to a lesser extent, basketball. And here we are, it's mid-April, and you can name 12 baseball teams already. Half the teams in the league, you can already guarantee you won't mm -hmm. be in the postseason. I think that hurts a sport overall. I think football has really become a sport where um, – you have to have so many great players, but there are other replaceable parts. At basketball, it's much more difficult. I mean, you need three or four really talented players. Football, you need three or four. You need a quarterback, you need a left tackle, you need a pass rusher, and then all of a sudden, things start to fall into place. And that makes the, the ability to manage the team within a cap structure a lot more effective. Okay, can I ask a quick question to Frank and, and Charles that uh, – you, you, you hear, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think football is very unique, and you look at the median salary in the NFL, but then what would you say there are about 10 guys who are... Do, do you ever see a day when this, when this bargaining unit breaks up and we reach a point where whoever, Peyton Manning or Tom Brady says, you know what, God bless him, but my interests are just not aligned with that lineman making $380,000. And we see, you know, we see this in other industries that obviously are different landscapes and we don't have... The unique skill set, but you know, in the police union, the core the captains aren't making what the beat cops are. You know, they're they're in a separate union. Do you ever see that in, in a sport like football, where we have this huge disparity in wages? I personally don't see that happening. I mean, I think that um, players are still a, a team, um, and uh, while they will not be envious, or they may be envious of someone making the most money. I think they would be far more interested in having uh, a, a union having to, uh, some impact on this distribution. Because I think the last thing they would want, and I think the last thing a quarterback would want, is to not be in the union. I'm making more money because I don't think uh, the right tackle over there should make as much. And I wonder how long he would survive in that kind of environment. <laughs> Frank, what are you going to um, say? No, I, I, I would agree with Charles. I think that there's internal fights within the union in terms of performance-based pay, in terms of the um, rookie pool structure uh, for draftees and so on and so forth. But bottom line is these guys all want to be paid for performance. and. You know, if Peyton Manning's performance is such that he can do much, much um, better in terms of wages, um, I think most of the players will say, God bless him. And Peyton Manning, at the same point, is going to realize, I don't run very often. When I run, people block. <laughs> when I throw, people have to catch it. So, you know, I may be a big name, but I'll make it in endorsements. I won't make it... Uh, um, in the wages, because this is a team game. John? No, I mean, I realistically, I, I, I agree with that, but I do think it's worth pointing. I mean, this is a huge disparity in wages, and a lot of times what uh, the star players are being asked to, to cap, to give up, basically, is, is pretty significant. And yet, you're, I mean, obviously, you know, if, you, if you're squabbling with your lineman, your quarterback, you've got, you've got bigger issues than a couple yeah. million dollars. But I do think it's, it's, it's a fascinating, from a 
you can't find too many other bargaining units where you have such a huge spread of, of, of salaries. I don't know if you guys remember the quarterback club, though. It used to be a quarterback club, and, <laughs> uh, and they actually uh, took on some of that characteristic. But the bottom line was that they still didn't want to be differentiated as being uh, special from that standpoint. Quarterback club also I don't, it didn't go so well for those guys either in the end. Michael, were you going to add something to this? Well, you know, the thing is, the, the thing that there is a system within the system is in the rookie pool, and what I was talking about the rookie pool, the players from 1 through 15 actually make more than 16 through the rest of the draft combined. And so there's, when people talk about we have to change the rookie pool, we only have to change the top 15 picks, or, you know, because if you have three second round picks, they're like gold and they're the most valuable commodity you could have because you're going to get three starting players for four years at a really economic value. Whereas if you have the first pick in the draft and you're the Carolina Panthers, you can't even trade the pick because nobody wants to assume the $55 million burden that's going to go with it. And this year, with the uncertainty of no labor agreement, who's going to want to make the pick? It's almost going to be Carolina's going to have to give you something to take it off their hands. It used to only be the number one overall pick, and then it became the first five, and now it's stretched down to 15, that, that yeah. money. And that's the credit to the agents because they've been able to piggyback, you know, that, that got the sixth guy in, then the next year we'll get the seventh guy in, and the next year we'll get the eighth guy. And, and you know, and, you know we, and we, even though we're sharing the information because we can because we're collectively bargained, we still mess it up. Well, you know, part of the problem is that if you, if you notice today, if you look at the football uh, conflict. Um, <clears throat> it's very difficult for the union, or was very difficult for the union, to keep the rookies out of the draft. And if you want to speak to a point of where and how powerful the union is and the internal politics between the union and agents, it's very clear here that the agents were making a pretty strong stand, and that is that they did not, they do not want a very stringent rookie wage scale because that clearly hits their pocket. And as a result, if you notice, the union was forced into changing the way in which they're going to celebrate the draft. Because initially, they wanted the union, as a matter of fact, the, the union wanted the agents and the players to stay away from the draft, which I didn't think was a good idea anyway. But the point is that it backfired because, again, the influence of the agents had a different agenda here. And that is that if we're going to start capping the rookies as well, then my wages are going down. I'm, I'm going to give some hypothetical job change changes to a couple gentlemen in the middle, and we can all jump in from there. Frank, we've just named you head of the NFL Players Association. <laughs> what, what is the most important topic to you right now to get a deal, and, and, and what's your strategy? Now. Now. <laughs> or before, we can go back a little bit. Yeah, I wouldn't have decertified. This is all about information at the end of the day. And I think that um, it's forcing management to share enough information that you can make a reasoned judgment and make a case to your constituents that, you know, this makes sense. Um, and the NFL has been stiff-arming on information flow. Why'd they decertify? Two reasons. Number one, well, three reasons. Number one is it's the trick play that worked the last time. You know, trick plays don't necessarily work every time, and so I'm not sure that I would have done that. I think that they've got a real risk of being found to have um, used decertification as a sham here, ultimately by the NLRB. Um, they decertified for reason number two, which Charles alluded to, which is to get some more leverage in the negotiation. Eventually, you can decertify if you feel you need the treble damages hammer. Um, but number three is they wanted information. They were being stiff-armed in terms of um, what they were getting uh, from uh, the um, management side. Uh, they made concessions conditioned on opening the books uh, as part of their last minute move. Um, I think I would have let management make the first aggressive move and then just started beating the drum about, okay, they're making an aggressive move. Why won't they show me that they need to do it? And I think that ultimately the fans identify 
more with the players than they do with the uh, ownership. The players are strong uh, and collective bargaining lives well here because the players are the show. Um, I think that it would have served them better in the long term not to have decertified. But, but let, let me ask you a question. I think that Demara Smith has the hardest job of anybody because he is, takes on this task that essentially he's going to take less money than his predecessor negotiated over mm -hmm. the whole realm of the deal. How does he sell that to himself? I mean, it's his first negotiated contract, mm -hmm. and he's got to stand in front of everybody and say, fellas, I, I just negotiated less money for you. I thought his caveat was the 18 games. I thought he could carry that ball and stand in front of the players and say, you know, they, 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 we gave them this, but I beat them up for 18 games, and we're not playing 18 games. But when the commissioner released that statement, and gave up away, it gave away to me DeMaris Smith's ability to say, see what I got for you. The trade off. Yeah, I know. It's, and I think that's, his, I think his hardest job is to convince, is how does he do a deal that he knows he's going to take a lesser deal? Yeah. And the only way he can do but that is through courts. There's, there's two pieces in terms of lesser deal. Second thing that I would be doing if I hadn't decertified, is I would have been, I would be trying to figure out a way to align economic interests better. Um, you know, there's the tension, agent tension, uh, in terms of wanting more paragraph five and in terms of wanting shorter amortization rules so that you can get more signing bonuses and so on and so forth. Um, Management, and this is something that I participated in when I was involved in these negotiations, always tried to push for benefits. Um, I think that you trade off lower cash comp for benefits, some of which are funded on the come, align your interests longer term. You need to do it anyway because you get beat up in Congress periodically for not taking care of the people who built the game. Um, you know, that's the win-win is you figure something like that out. Um, we, we, the you're, commissioner's you're, statement did undercut him, but I think that there's still a way out. I, you're I absolutely right that, that, that benefits to retired players and players are, are hard to get at the bargaining table because the current players don't want to give up any of theirs and the owners yep. think they've already paid. But it's a, it's a business issue now facing sports, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And that management's using it to beat them up. I'm going to give you a new job, uh, Charles. We're going to make you commissioner of the NBA. I know that probably doesn't seem like a likely outcome. <laughs> but somebody recently said that, that, that football doesn't have a big crisis, particularly. They're, the sides aren't that far apart. That baseball seems to have solved some of their problems that, that it had historically led them into some problems. But basketball has some real crises. You've now been put in charge of the ownership coalition. Uh, probably based on your success dealing with them in the past, what are your moves and, and, and where do you go now? Well, before I get there, let me step back on the football side for a second. If I were the commissioner there, um, I, I see, I think it really boils down to they do have a framework for a deal and that deal is the 18 games which will generate more revenue and in spite of the fact that the players don't want to play more games, well, neither do baseball players want it, to play. Is, 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 is 18 games that way new money to solve some That's, of the problems? It certainly is new money in terms of negotiating because you've got new television revenue, et cetera. You can look at that. And if I were a commissioner in football or basketball, I would be going more toward the lifestyle and the life of NBA or NFL players. And that is that what they want is the same thing you want. You want security. You want um, uh, health benefits, and you may want them lifelong. But the point of the matter is that the young people who play this game play from 21 to 25, 21 to 23, 21 to 27. Where they're going to need most of that money and where they're going to need health and care uh, benefits will be between somewhere between 30 and 50. And so the question is, as a leader in the sport, and if I were the commissioner in either sport, would I be looking to figuring out ways that I can make that possible to them? Because most, after they play football or basketball or baseball, will be looking at some other career that they will spend the rest of their life doing. So if I go back and look at long-term security and how could I do that? In football, I think it's more guaranteed contracts. In spite of the fact that the NFL would not like to see guarantee, guaranteed contracts, they're already giving up signing bonuses, which is more guaranteed. I would look at a different way of compensating 
football players so that they give them an incentive to come to the table and get this deal done. In basketball, um, it's, it's a little bit different because, in fact, the players do have access to the books. And quite frankly, I think the players in football have access to the books. Whether they, whether they use the auditing process that's uh, involved in this revenue sharing is clearly up to them if they haven't used it. But clearly, you can get access to, through the auditing process, three to four teams per year. And over a six year period, you may have access to 18 to 20 teams. So in terms of transparency, it's in both sports really. So the, the challenge is whether you're gonna be a problem solver. And as a problem solver, I think uh, quite frankly, David has done a fairly good job at that, that he looks at the perspective of here are the players, what can I do to make their job uh, easier, but more importantly, uh, make them uh, closer to this question of partnership. Now, granted, they're going to have more financial difficulty this year, and there probably will be a lockout. But a lockout to me sometimes clearly is getting a deal done. Um, uh, as long as you don't miss games, then the lockout in my may becomes irrelevant. Is that you as commissioner or you as, as a former union head Well, there? as a commissioner, <laughs> as I said, commissioner, I would look more at the point of long t longevity, uh, long term. How do I help players? Um, um, in the majority part of their life. So when you look at uh, what the NBA is going to have to do, um, they have more of a financial problem. But again, I think um, having access to those books, if in fact there is a problem, you'll see it pretty quickly. Um, and don't forget one thing. You have the same lawyers that represent uh, football owners represent basketball owners, represent hockey owners. The same lawyers who represent football players represent basketball players. So it's, it's clear that what's going on now in football will have some effect on basketball. But the solution, I think, is there. It still boils down to balance, and it boils down to uh, what someone perceives this fair share of $100 is. It's really how we divide $100. We. If I was commissioner of MLB? Yeah, we'll promote you. That'd be a great day, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, there, there are two key things that I look at specifically right now. One is the revenue sharing program and the accountability and responsibility of the teams receiving 20, 30, 50 million dollars and what they're doing with it. And I think the big issue that really needs to be addressed right now is why are we seeing four or five teams in such financial disarray? And I'm not only talking about the Mets and the Dodgers right now. I'm looking at the Tampa Bay Rays and I'm looking at the Oakland Athletics. Uh, we're talking about ball clubs that can't get uh, public-private finance facilities. Uh, we're looking at issues there. And I think the big one that I would also look at is how the draft is currently structured, whether or not slotting fees are the right course of action. Uh, and also, if we're looking at minimum wage being $414,000 for a uh, major league ball player now, why is a high school player just getting drafted signing a $5.5 million signing bonus on top of maybe a $10 million contract? That's what we saw with Bryce Harper and Strasburg and uh, Jameson Talion with, with the Pirates. Those are like the three things that I would really isolate and want to focus on. Michael, you've been on the team side of this for most of your career. From a team standpoint, what are the most important things you, you're going to have in the next collective bargaining agreement for it to be a success? Well, I think the 18 games is not a single item. I think 18 games have to be packaged around limiting the off-season activity. Uh, you know, there's way too much contact in the off-season. 18 games can stand if we change the way we approach the off-season, which is con the conditioning, the OTA days, all the time the players are on the field. All those reps add up to more collisions, more damage to themselves, more than the 18 games will. They play 20 now and they play 10 plays in the first quarter, they play a quarter in the second game, they play three quarters in the third game, they don't play in the fourth. So really they're adding really one game to it. So how we put that one game in, that's what I would really, really emphasize and how to work on the off season as opposed to letting the coaches just go out there and practice coaching. I think that would be the first thing I would do. The other thing I would do is change the top half of the draft. I think it's really, it's an it's it's imbalanced and the other factor, I think Charles is right on, I would change the deferment comp laws in the league because it's very hindersome and it creates bigger problems. In the NFL, you're only allowed to defer a million dollars out past one year. 
it becomes a little complicated issue, but you can only, if I gave you $5 million and I pay you a million today and I want to pay you $4 million in, in February of 2013, I have to send the league a check to, to secure that money. I get a million free. So the, that rule was put in so owners made payments back in the 60s. Frank, now, you probably wrote that provision at some point? No, but no. I argued for it a long time. <laughs> To change it? No, to keep it. Well, the problem with keeping it, Frank, is this, is it creates other ways to give the players the money. I know. And, and that opens up a whole can of worms, see? So when you hear this term <laughs> option bonus, all an option bonus is is a way to get around the deferment rules. Yeah. And an option bonus is, allows you to then not have to fund the money because the rule's in. So a little bit like our tax codes, it becomes so many loopholes, then yeah. create bigger problems within the system. And I think if you change that, I think you'd be able to have better cap, because if I could guarantee, say I, get Peyton, say I had a player I wanted to pay him 25 million, I wanted to guarantee 4 million a year for four years, then I could do that, I wouldn't have to fund that money. That becomes an easy <clears throat> contract to live with. This, I know my fixed costs are flat across the board, but why can't I do that? Because the years three and four of the contract, I have to send that money to the league office, and I have to come out of my cash flow. And that becomes a real issue. Cash flow in the NFL is a huge issue. That's why we defer things and move things around in option bonuses. So I yeah. change those. I, I will just say in response to that, and then you and I can talk about the debt ceiling another time. Uh, Harold Katz. Um, some of you may remember him. He sold the 76ers for a buck plus assumption of unfunded player liability. That's actually the source of the deferred comp rule. So I'm cool with it changing it as long as you have to reserve part of your debt capacity and so on and so forth uh, to that, but uh, uh, to um, guaranteed player comp. But that was never part of the internal debate among the ownership. And I think that that is something that's in both parties' interests. I've got a question for you, Michael. Did the uh, disciplinary changes in 06, the Ricky Williams recapture and all that, did that bother you running a club? Well, yeah, because what, what happened was, uh, you know, if you gave a guy a roster bonus and you try to attach signing bonus language to the roster bonus, and then if he retired on you, the league ruled that he couldn't, he wasn't, didn't, wasn't entitled to paying you back. And we were told in a league meeting in Atlanta, you might have been in the meeting, if it looks like a signing bonus and it smells like a signing bonus, we're going to count it a signing bonus. Well, that one bit me in the butt because the, the Minnesota Vikings gave Antoine Winfield a $10 million roster bonus with the with with what we call um, with the default language in it, which means if he were to retire, he'd have to pay that roster bonus back. Well, the roster bonus essentially is if you're on the roster that day, you get the money. It shouldn't carry default language with it, which is what the union argued, and they were proven right, but the league office treated it as a signing bonus. And that, that really bothers me because we were trying to get around, the, some of the teams with cap room were trying to get around the rules. And it really and it affected myself because Charles Woodson's cap number went from 7.2 million to 8.4 because of the Winfield contract. Yeah, well, um, that particular rule was the biggest landmine that I thought was embedded in Gene's term sheet the last time around because it both impaired your ability to manage the cap at a team level and um, also made it harder to enforce you know, the disciplinary uh, provisions and so on and so forth. Um, so that's one that if I were at a team, I would think would be one that would be high on the change list. So. Yeah, the other one I think you have to have in every contract, although Charlie Weiss would disagree with me and so would Jake Delholm, is offset language. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I would have given Jake Delholm $21 million at the Raiders and not had offset language in it, I wouldn't have gotten fired. I'd have been shot out back during the party. So I don't know how, and Marty Herney kept his job. I mean, that's the remarkable aspect of it. Let, let, me, let me just switch gears and kind of cap this. It, you guys are sort of pointing toward the fact, and is, and is it true generally that there really are three business models at work in professional sports? There is the players, there's the league, which in some case manages the television contracts, the marketing contracts, and then there are the individual franchises, and their interests aren't always aligned, and that's maybe one of the causes of some of the problem we're having right now. Well, I know uh, doing most times we talk about revenue sharing, there clearly were uh, owners in the room that didn't want a uh, salary cap or a revenue share uh, simply because they thought it would inhibit their chances of being champions. Uh, so there were allies uh, that typically you had as a labor uh, union 
that would prevent uh, a, a salary cap. You know, one of the things that I think we talk about the acrimony between players and, and owners, um, one of the things I think uh, would bode well for both sides is that the collective bargaining agreements did not have an opt-out. Because uh, unlike, unlike individual contracts, maybe different, but it's clear that everyone focused on management because they opted out of the contract and they became the bad guy. Um, and quite frankly, I think when you enter these collective bargaining agreements, um, you know that it's a four-year deal or a five-year deal or a six-year deal. And quite frankly, you know if in fact you are ownership, you know you're gonna opt out at a certain time because you can. And, um, but without that, then clearly once the contract ends, you're just negotiating another new contract. And no one is the bad guy. The contract ends and you're gonna negotiate a new one. Is, you know, you don't think the opt-out keeps people honest and, uh, you know, no, no one wins in a route because you feel like you're getting uh, That's your, right. your butt kicked. I mean, you, you don't think the opt-out serves its purpose? That I it's don't think it does at all because um, <clears throat> uh, the union clearly isn't going to opt out. And if you sign a six-year contract in collective bargaining, that's a, that's a long contract in collective bargaining. Now, sports has made it uh, sort of normal, but typically you're looking at three or four years. But if you make it six years, then you're going to live with it for six years. The opt-out, I think, changes things. As soon as management decided to opt out of the NFL contract, it was big news across the country, and immediately they were cast as being the bad people. And nobody knew that the players had the same opt-out. It was amazing, and D. Smith kept saying it in every press conference yeah. when the players, if there was been a bad deal for them, they could have opted out. And, and he got a lot of mileage out of that opt-out when, when it was essentially built in for both sides, because I think what Frank said earlier is, Contrary to what most people think, I don't think everybody really knew what the deal was. I remember when Mr. Davis came back from the meeting, he really couldn't explain to me what actually happened there. He voted yes, but he really couldn't say what actually. Well, you, you know, I'm surprised to hear. I mean, you don't think, sort of, given how volatile the economy is, how volatile sort of new media rights that can spring up, you, you don't think you need that out for both sides? Five right? years. I mean, if, if you're going to be, if you have a six-year contract and opt out after five, it would be different if it was a six-year contract and you can opt out after two or three. But five years, then that one extra year, think about this situation now. One extra year at the current terms in football would be a bad thing or not? Well, we lived with it yeah. last year. Yeah. You lived right, with it last exactly. year. You can certainly live with it one more year. Frank, Frank, and and actually, if we go back and say the judge hypothetically rules, we go back to 2010 rules, there'll be another year where there'll be no minimum spending, and there'll be another year where a lot of teams will make a significant amount of money based on the TV revenues. Frank, you did a lot of side letters uh, and, 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 and sort of modifications <laughs> rather than an opt-out. Is, uh, is that an effective system if the sides can agree? Uh, th that was part of the system. Um, it wasn't really side letters. I mean, um, the classic strategy was roll over the TV and then you know what your pie is going to be and then sit down and have the discussion of how you split up the hundred bucks. Um, and so that system worked very well. You'd try and lock in the union through a short extension, do your TV deal, and then sit down immediately and do a longer deal and you were able to match your revenues to expenses fairly well. The side letters really related to individual projects and so on and so forth. Uh, the G3 stadium cap, uh, construction credit. Each stadium project had to be approved by the union in terms of the level of support and commitment and so on and so forth. And you'd have to sit down and you'd have to talk through the economics of the project and reach a side letter on that. Um, there were commercial side letters that were entered into from time to time, and um, you know it was it, everybody saw the pie got a lot bigger when the union rights that formerly were marketed by Players Inc. got uh, lumped in with the Jersey rights marketed by Properties. Uh, so you do those sorts of side letters, but they're all nibbling around the edges within the basic framework of the deal. I, I'm only going to stop you for a second. We're going to lose Michael Lombardi because he has to go off to the NFL Network yeah, to do uh, to do a TV I interview. Uh, well, the we schedule's can, coming out at seven o'clock, so that's a we good can, thing. If we get right. the schedule. Right. Good. The you good news. The, the good news with this is that we can go on for a few minutes thank more. Um, thank you, warm hand for Michael Lombardi. Uh, 
we can go on a few minutes more. I want to I want to ask some questions of the panelists, kind of on on, on how they see things going. Uh, John, you're, you've been covering this. You're, you're sort of our voice of, of, of the fan in this. You're, 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 you're watching this. You're a lawyer. How, how has football gone, and, and how would you grade the participants, and, and how would you grade the media in explaining it? Well, I, I mean, I, I think if you take a step back, it's been pretty predictable. I mean, if you sort of six months out, if you had to say, this is how the chess game's going to go, and where are we on April 19th, I don't, I don't think there have been a... I don't think there have been any significant surprises, really. Um, I think, you know, the, from a media perspective, it's, it's very funny because the clear message from, from ratings and from surveys, the fans really don't care. They don't want to get into, they, they don't care about Minnesota and who's going to forced mediation and decertificate. They just want their football. And yet, sort of the countervailing force there is that perception means a ton. And if you're greedy players who are getting fat at the trough and there's not going to be football, you're in trouble. And if you're the greedy owners who are abusing these poor players who have these health – yeah, I mean, I, th I think perception plays a huge role, but no one – the common fan doesn't really have the patience for the ins and outs of collective bargaining. So it's a very strange balance. But I think, you know, the, the media I, – I think the media has been pretty fair. I don't think the coverage has really – I mean, I think the retired players is – a little bit of a red herring. I, I don't think the coverage has really been particularly pro-union or uh, pro-management. This is interesting, though. It's, it's clearly been the most public of labor disputes ever. Could you, would you ever have for, foreseen this in your first one, gentlemen, going back to the first one you did? You couldn't imagine Twittering and, and, and doing a <laughs> campus tour like they, they do today? I think so, because um, each year, as the sports become more and more popular, uh, fans are more educated than ever, and they would like to know what happens to their favorite player when he leaves college, or if, in fact, if he becomes a free agent. Do I have a chance of improving my team as a New York Knick or a New York Jet? Uh, and as a result of that, I think the, um, the celebrity that surrounds these negotiations are really pointed toward uh, what happens to my team and how can my team get better? One of the biggest complaints I had about the most recent collective bargaining agreements really, I think, uh, worked itself out here in New York, and that is that it's very difficult for a team reaching rock bottom to become good. Uh, and how can you do that? Well, with the kinds of restrictions on, on, on wages and free agents, et cetera, fans are saying, well, look, I want, I want the Knicks to be in the playoffs. How can we get that done? And so I think that has kind of led into a much more interest in the workings of these uh, individual collective bargaining agreements. Okay. John? Okay, just a real quick point. People laugh when I say this, but I, I think fantasy leagues have had a big bearing yeah. on this, that people know what salaries are and they know who's going to go where in the draft. And I think everybody's sort of their own GM now. And I think in, in some ways it's good because you know, the fans are that much more connected to the sport. But I think, I think that has a, a not insignificant role in the public attention here. Wayne? I, I really think that the, the, the fans have become even more sympathetic to the players' cause. I, I think that's the one thing that we've seen, uh, first and foremost, because of the non-guaranteed contracts, and I think most importantly, what has happened with the concussions and the health of NFL players after their, their playing careers. And you know, we've mentioned it time and time again, the average playing career, about three to five years, life, in, life expectancy rates and everything. And now, I think with this information coming forward, a lot of people are taking a sympathetic view to the players, saying, wait a minute, this is a nine, ten billion dollar industry. Why can't the two sides come together and share it equally? As mentioned before, this is the golden goose. So I think we're seeing more fans become more sympathetic to the to the plight of the players. Frank, anything? Um, I think the coverage has been generally balanced. I think that there will be more player sympathy um, than owner sympathy. Um, that's not my guess, uh, necessarily going to be the case in the NBA. Um, but I think that the coverage has been superficial, um, and that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, give me a break. This whole thing in Minnesota is about primary jurisdiction, NLRB, and, and does uh, Norris LaGuardia um, withdraw the ability of the court to issue an injunction? That was boring to me in law school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, Frank, let me let me ask you a question. Why do you foresee more trouble in the NBA or more or more pro ownership coverage in the NBA? Um, because I think that a lot of the football guys are perceived as sympathetic grunts. They are, you know, the right guard. Uh, you know, the left tackle is sort of a celebrity these days because he's guarding the blind side, but the right tackle, who cares about, unless you've got a left-handed quarterback. <laughs> um, and um, because there's more of them, because it is very much the uh, blue-collar kind of game, NBA is more of a stars game. Um, and I think that also the NBA probably does have more financial difficulties um, than the NFL. Um, you know, the, the NFL has a great cushion, uh, 58 something like that percent of their revenues um, come from television. Um, and Roger has done a great job of extending out the TV contracts. He did it um, at a great time, too. Uh, he did it in an economic downturn when people start cocooning, when they stay home. So the ratings have skyrocketed. He's driven his own value for the next TV contracts. NBA, I think 40-odd percent of their revenue comes from media. A lot of that's from local media and not national. They're a much more attendance-driven game. So the downturn, I think, has probably bitten them in the backside a lot more than it has the NFL. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to, we, we've talked for about an hour on, on my watch, and, and, and I'm going to kind of get to an exit question. We'll take some questions from our audience, but let me, let me go to the exit question that, that, that I foresee, and you're, you can feel free to have a last word even after that. But if we came together a year from now, tell us what the situation is in each sport, and we'll throw this open as sort of a free-for-all. Where will we be in football a year from now? What, what will have happened? And what will, what will have been the key issue to bring us together or keep us apart? Well, I mean, I think the big X factor here is that right now it's all very theoretical, but when athletes who, as we've talked about, has a very career short, you know, very short career shelf life are missing checks, when you've got three years, four years to, to make this significant salary and those checks aren't coming and debts are mounting, you're in a different position than you are in, in middle of April. So I, mean, I think that I think sort of missing from all, and the same goes to some extent to the owners too, when you have this debt service payments on these huge stadiums. I mean, at, at some level now, it's a very theoretical exercise, and in August when people are really feeling the pinch, I think we'll have a much better and more realistic view of where, where both sides are. Wayne? I, I feel the same way. I, I think with, within a year from now, Game's going to be back to normal. We're going to be looking at revenue streams coming in, in in a strong manner. But we're going to look back and say, why did we fight over these issues? Uh, obviously, the health of the players is of paramount importance. But you know, we go back and say, well, this is a $9, $10 billion sport. What really drove us to the point of having you know, conversations in courtrooms in Minnesota rather than worrying about the NFL draft the way we should be at this moment in time? Um, yeah, I think you'll see a season. I think there's a chance that you can miss exhibition games. Um, uh, I, I think things do change when paychecks are missing. Um, and when revenue stops to come in, stop coming in, then things have a, cha have a, have a chance, rather, of, of uh, somehow uh, finding a solution uh, on the one hand. On, on the other hand, uh, in football, again, you're looking at the establishment of two reputations because this is the first time that both Roger and 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 uh, have De Maurice uh, have engaged in a collective bargaining experience, and um, it, it's the next agreement that they're concerned about now as well. That if I don't get off on a good foot here, that three, five, six years from now, um, where will I be? So uh, it's important for both of them. How, how important? Can I ask you how, how important do you? Because that's one thing you hear all the time is that we have these two rookies, and they both not only have their constituents, but there's some ego, and they've never negotiated with each other before. I mean, you you guys have both been there. I mean, how how big an issue is that? Well, I think for a first timer, it's important because um, <clears throat> particularly here in this environment uh, in football, because he's following a legend, uh, Gene Upshaw. Um, it, no matter how you look at it, it looks like he may end up taking less. 
So the perception is going to be that he didn't do as good a job for the players, where in fact that's probably not going to be true, but that will be the perception. Um, Roger has the same uh, problem. He's following someone that was extremely successful with regard to the relationship between management and labor. And on the first time out of the box, he's gonna have a lockout and maybe miss games. So that will have an impact on his reputation going forward. So I, I think it's important. Is that one of the reasons why D. Smith hasn't, even when the owners moved toward him, he didn't, he, he moved to decertify, to, 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 to show a tougher reputation? Well, I think the decertification route is a, is a, is a different discussion. I mean, the, the politics of the union, um, how do I gain leverage at a time when management is looking to reduce my fair share of the economic pie? What's available to me? Well, guess what? The law is available, and quite frankly, he's a former prosecutor, understands winning and prosecuting, so clearly he looks at that as an advantage for him to serve. Well, Frank, what will we say about the NBA a year from now? <clears throat> I'd rather say what I think we'll say about baseball, which okay. is they renewed on time and with relatively <laughs> uh, few um, public disagreements. I think that they've got a pretty decent system in place and pretty good people in place. Um, as to NBA, I really don't know. I really that's that's a hard one for me to to know. Um, as to NFL, I think you will lose some regular season games. And I think that there will be some serious bruises, but uh, no broken bones. I'll be surprised if we miss games in basketball. Um, because even if you follow through with a lockout in July, the season doesn't start till November. So um, you still have time to get that deal done. And I, I just would be very surprised if they miss games. Yeah. The, the one thing that I worry about, and the reason I don't want to offer an opinion on basketball, is I know what the calendar is with respect to the NFL in terms of pressure points and in terms of if I get past this, then my next pressure point is there. And I don't know that in the um, NBA. But in the NFL, the reason I think that you'll lose games is there's no pressure points internally between now and mid-July. Very interesting. Oh, that was going to be my follow-up. Wayne? The, the NBA is, I, I think, on the collision course for some contentious situations over the summer. Um, but I do agree with the timing mechanism that by November it should be worked out. But I think if we view the NFL as being somewhat problematic and messy right now in terms of what's going on with the lockout, I think the NBA is going to be far worse. I think there's going to be bumps and bruises along the way, but I think with David Stern and Billy Hunter trying to get everything together, we'll see something by November, and so we won't miss regular season games. I will say this. If the uh, courts rule in favor of the players here on this D cert, then, you're, then you have a whole different situation in basketball. We'll, we'll see games. Would, would, you, would you possibly see a decertified NBA for a period of time? Well, uh, as I pointed out before, you have the same lawyers that represent the owners and the same lawyers that represent the players. So I would think that part of their strategy would be to decertify. Is there any problem in having those same owners and our same lawyers on both sides? Well, you would think that they would learn something, but, uh, <laughs> but on the one hand, on the other hand, they're getting paid very well. Yeah, you know, the sad thing is that um, because of the adversarial collective bargaining system and because it's so steeped in NLRB lore and precedent, you've got too many lawyers involved. Yeah, that's right. um, I mean, you know, the great thing about uh, Upshaw and Tagliabu was Upshaw was not a lawyer and Tagliabu didn't want to be one anymore. <laughs> and, um, you know, right now, You've got a prosecutor who's getting his sea legs at the uh, NFLPA. You've got Jeff Kessler who has made his reputation and a ton of money litigating um, McNeil um, as probably his key advisor. Um, on the um, management side, you've got Jeff Pash and Bob Batterman both very capable guys who made their bones on the NHL lockout. You know, they're falling back on what they know. And there's nobody there who's 
stepping back and thinking about it as a businessman at this point and trying to create win-win situations. Um, and that said, it's going to happen eventually, but you know, we're going to have wasted time before it happens. Let me point out one other reason that I think is important to note. Um, and that is that the desert becomes an important strategy because ultimately they may get the courts to oversee the settlements of the antitrust lawsuits. Um, that's pretty important for a union. Uh, simply because you don't have the resources as management does, and it's key to have a judge as an arbiter when you need him. In other words, as disputes arise in this agreement, which they will, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to go, or a lot more important, to go to the judge and get a decision as opposed to finding its way through the courts. So an important part of the strategy is not only creating leverage, but also to get protection over the term of that agreement. Yeah. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to just use this time and say thank you very, very much for all that you've done and all that you've shared with us. I'm going to give you each a minute or two to take a last word and, 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 and share anything you haven't shared with us, and we'll go to questions right after that. Well, I think it's important. The collective bargaining process is extremely important. Perception is key in these negotiations, and quite frankly, um, I, I don't see a better way to resolve the disputes that arise in professional sports. Um, I'm glad that I do not have either D. Smith's job or Roger Goodell's job, because the thing that complicates this so much and that we've touched upon but not um, really delved as deeply into as um, really merits it is the internal constituencies that each of these guys has to manage. Um, those constituencies just make this a really, really, really difficult process. And, um, you know, they're, Every political skill that they have is going to be tested over the next few months in trying to square the circle with their own constituencies, even before reaching a deal. College football. <laughs> um, it's going to be a big season. No, I, <laughs> I, I, would, I would just reiterate that uh, it's, sort of, it's, it's all very theoretical right now. And um, you know, when, when, when checks are missing, we'll see where the parties stand. I think. This, this has, in a way, we always think of sports as sort of diversionary, and it's fantasy land, and it's our escape. Um, it's been interesting to sort of see sports move into, into courts and business and people getting crash courses on antitrust exemptions. But um, I I in the end, you just have to believe, for a variety of reasons, the internal politics, the missed paychecks, public... I mean, I, I, you know, what happens to one of these leagues? If you look historically, when a league's had work stoppage, it, it is not... Uh, it's taken them years to recover and needed a, a home run chase, uh, you know, that, that had other problematic components to it. But I think, in the end, I think we get games, and I think now we'd all rather be talking about sports than talking about courthouses. But I think, I think in the end, both of these uh, resolve themselves. I think for someone uh, who covers the business of baseball and follows with it as closely as I do, I'm kind of shocked that we're not probably going to see any type of lockout or strike in baseball. You know, we've only had five strikes and three lockouts since 1966, so this is a big shock for us. I, I think going forward, what we're going to see is advancements in the revenue sharing program, different language uh, stressing the accountability and responsibility. I think the luxury tax system will stay status quo. I think we'll see advancements towards an international draft in the sport, but there's a lot of legwork that has to be done before we get to that point. And I'll say something a little bit controversial. I think we will see language put in the collective bargaining agreement to explore contraction with the Major League Baseball. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience? There are microphones on both sides. Please step up. I'm going to ask one while I sit here, and it, it, it's just an observation one, that in 2011, we were, we were six men as panelists, and that's kind of unusual in the world. Our demographics as a program is a, a closer to 50% women. Why, why would you say that is, if anybody wants to hazard that guess, is that we're all, we're all guys at this point still? And do you see a Hope change coming? we remain coming? guys, yeah. If we remain guys. 
I mean, we started in... <laughs> when did you start, Charles? I started in 93. It wasn't as enlightened. I think 20 years from now, you'll see a very different situation. Well, there are women in influential positions in professional sports, starting with the commissioner or the president of the WNBA. Um, <clears throat> and I would think that um, I know in the NBA that clearly um, uh, staff attorneys and others who are also uh, involved in the process of uh, collective bargaining, et cetera, et cetera. And in baseball, I know there are quite a few high-profile women who have influential uh, positions and jobs. So I think the future uh, uh, is, looks good. Um, and I think the only reason we don't have a female up here is you didn't invite one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's go to the audience immediately then. <laughs> uh, let, let me start it off. Uh, I'm sure others will, will weigh in. In the past, we've had Paul Marthas and Dan Rooney's step up and, and sort of act as a bridge between management and players. Frank, is there a Dan Rooney who's not the ambassador of Ireland? Is there somebody like that who has the stature that can bridge old constituent owners with new constituent owners is owners and understand the players and be the kind of uh, players owner that, that Dan Rooney is or was or is? Um, I think so, not necessarily in terms of the players, um, although there I do think that there are some owners who understand better um, than others uh, some of the perspectives, but I think, think certainly that the internal dynamic, there are people who can do that. Do they have the courage to do that? Can they step forward the way they will? Dan Rooney, they will. Okay. Eventually, yeah. And what about on the player side? Uh, Paul Martha is a former player, Pittsburgh lawyer, settled one of the one of the NFL disputes back in the 70s, uh, as I recall, uh, or maybe it was the 82 strike. But is there is there somebody who can step forward on the player side, uh, former player? One of the interesting people I think of is the is the president of the Green Bay Packers who used to be an intrinsic part of the Players Association. Mark Murphy. Yeah, Mark Murphy. and mm -hmm. I remember in the 82 or 87 uh, labor discussion, he was, a, he was kind of the bridge on the player's side. Now he has a public entity in the sense that his, his finances are transparent. Perhaps he might play a role. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, rather not comment. Yeah. Well, my experience in that is typically that doesn't matter. Because once you crossed over, once you become employed by uh, management, that's how the players perceive you. And they know that that's uh, your agenda and your interest. So it's very unlikely that you'll get them to resolve the issue for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, given, given how large the business of football has become, which some might argue is, is too big, um, given that and under the understanding that it will that it will continue to go that way. Do you think what we're seeing now with the CBA is going to become more commonplace in the future when it comes time to renegotiate than, you know, right now it's kind of a once every however long type of thing. Do you think in the NFL specifically because it is such a giant and it can be argued that they're just gonna keep getting bigger, revenue's going to keep growing, do you think this, is, this type of contentious bargaining is going to continue? I, I can tell you that in 1980, when we uh, sat down and put together the first revenue sharing in sports, um, both the players and the owners were overcoming tremendous odds, meaning that the TV ratings were poor, attendance was down, and we were losing money. Four teams had come in from the uh, ABA in 76. They were losing money, and we weren't doing well. It was very easy to sit down and come up with a collective bargaining agreement that would foster prosperity on both sides. Today, since everyone is seemingly far more successful and there's far more money involved, uh, I mean, in, in 1980, we didn't conceive of someone making $100 million a year, okay? A uh, $100 million contract, rather. Uh, but that growth can only foster uh, more greed uh, and I say that on both sides. Uh, and as a result, you're going to continue to see this kind of um, uh, dispute, debate over uh, what's rightfully uh, belongs to each party. Thank you. Jay? Um, 
my, my question was more directed towards the NBA. Um, I guess reading a, a lot of articles about it, they reportedly lost, reported $400 million last year. And the one thing after knowing a lot of guys that play basketball in the NBA um, who think they're rich but they're really not uh, because they live more paycheck to paycheck, and after knowing a lot of owners in the NBA as well and seeing the kind of margins that they're able to produce uh, profitable-wise, how, how do you see the, the players ever gaining any leverage as far as going forward. I mean, uh, a guy like Kobe Bryant, who I mean, pretty much laughed at a statement the other day saying, I would never play for $10 million. He's always going to have leverage. But how does the middle guy or the lower guy ever gain any leverage going forward with the players kind of being, it's like Vegas always wins. Well, two things. One is uh, I think they're clearly trying to look at the formula so that they can change that and, and take care of, quite frankly, some of those teams that aren't doing well. Um, and the teams that aren't doing well, it's going to have to be uh, sort of settled that uh, teams have not either misfunded uh, or, you know, typically not run their teams well. But um, the, the, the leverage for the middle class player has been the salary cap. And it has been the distribution of wealth within the league, the rookie wage scale. Those things have generated, I think, uh, uh, probably salaries that are far higher for the middle guy than ever before. I mean, now you're looking at average salaries in the NBA approaching $6 million as an average. Um, 15, 20 years ago, it was either the stars made the money and you had fewer people on the low end. That middle class really wasn't quite uh, in existence at that time. But, but one thing that, that I think we keep missing here when we start talking about uh, work stoppages and um, uh, unrest and players missing paychecks. Um, and that, and that, and again, a point comes back to the middle class, and that is that how do we make sure, as a union, you have this responsibility? How do make sure that you are not locked out? I mean, your job is to make sure the players continue to play. Because in any lockout situation, when a player loses a salary or half of his salary, you know, and I recall in 97, because I represented Charles Oakley, he had a $10 million payment that year. They missed half the season. He lost $5 million bucks. Now, whatever they got in return, was there a cost-benefit analysis associated with that? In other words, how long could we stay out to ensure that Charles wouldn't lose $5 million? Because Charles will never get his $5 million back, no matter what you negotiated. The owner who keeps his team for 25 or 30 years over a longer period of time will be reassured. Uh, we made whole again to some degree. So uh, it really does rest with an agreement that better distributes wealth in the league. And I think that the NBA is probably closer uh, than the other leagues, but um, it's something that will be an issue coming up in uh, July. Does anybody else want to weigh in on this one? Go ahead, Wayne. I think it's really education. I, I, I really believe that getting the right people to educate the players and giving them the whole perspective as to what's really going on and, and how to manage the money and how to set up structures and, and have that open dialogue that these are issues and that we're in this together. And, and this is all about all of us. It's not individuals. I go back to last summer and I, I looked at both the LeBron James situation going to Miami Heat and forming the triumvirate and that. But then I look at the Kevin Durant situation. No one really heard that Kevin Durant was staying with Oklahoma City. And I think that was huge for the league that a player of that stature is willing to stay in that market and try to make it work. But I think most importantly, I think it starts with the NFL with the education programs that it has done for the players, NBA has done it. I think that's the most important thing is these players becoming educated, understanding their rights, understanding what's going on and really getting uh, an entire landscape of the land rather than just looking at paycheck to paycheck. And I think we, we, we have this argument all the time. A $5 million a year salary, technically it's not $5 million. Take out taxes, take out agent fees, take out all of this other stuff, you're dealing with a couple of million dollars. Where does that go? So get into that point where all the players can kind of buy into that type of argument and say, we need more education. I think that's where the benefit will lie in the future. And the cool. problem with that, however, is that as you know, the lifespan's a lot shorter than the four years that they talk about. It's usually, if you make four, you may get seven. But typically getting to that 
three or four years is very difficult. And that turnover is so rapid that by the time the player comes in at 21 and at 24, he has some idea of what balance should be in his life financially, he's out. That's great. And so it's a constant revolving door. And let's make no mistake about professional sports. You're as good as your last game. And when I say you get a performance appraisal every game, you do. And at the end of the season, you're either in or you're out. If you don't have a guaranteed contract, you're gone. So while education is important, a, a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, what well, you can go into. You go back to college and, uh, you know, scholarship athletes. What should they be taught? Um, should they begin to understand how money works as a college that, uh, sophomore? That right? opens a really, really difficult, uh, difficult can of worms. Let me go to the next question. We, we, we will solve that one in our next conversation. Uh, yes, I just want to know for um, the upcoming NBA situation, there are a lot of teams that are necessarily failing or close to failing or having trouble. Do you think that there will be a contraction? And if there will be, how will that impact the lockout coming up if there is a lockout? Let me paraphrase only, only for the purpose of our, again, of our recording. Do you think that there'll be, do you think contraction will be on the table for the NBA this year? Um, I think it's, it's a mention. It's in the conversation uh, because if, in fact, you see they're asking for a 25 to 40 percent reduction in salaries, then you'll do it one way or the other if you get it negotiated or you may have to have contraction. I doubt that happens. Um, I, I don't see that as happening. Um, but, you know, the proof's in the pudding here. Um, uh, once you review the books, you'll find out how many teams are not doing well. You also have to have some liquidity to have contraction, don't you, to buy out the owners who would? Well, yes, that's, that's a whole different uh, debate that you'd have, but I, I don't really see that as happening. I, I mean, guys, we can look back at the last 25 years and count on one hand how many professional sports teams have actually filed bankruptcy <laughs> or actually gone out of business. It just hasn't happened, okay? So I, I don't see that as a reality. We're, we're just John, real quick, we're, we're also, uh, pe people have mentioned contraction uh, with the NBA, and people have mentioned, oh, well, the median salary will rise, but people forget that 60 jobs were taken, you know, get rid of four teams and that 60 jobs were taken off the table. So, um, you know, it's interesting to see where the, the, the union's got a, a play to make there because uh, it may, may change the salary structure for the average guy on the Lakers, but, you, you know, you, you kill off the Memphis Grizzlies, and that's, that's 15 Fifteen union salaries, right there. I, I'm only going to. I'm only caution. We're going to. The, the, the four people that are standing will, or the three people that are standing, will, four people that are saying, we'll take your questions. We we'll, won't take any more, and we'll try to make them quick if we can. Over here, please. Sure. Um, my question back to the NFL and talking about the TV revenue leading up to the lockout and talking to players last season. Their big concern was, well, if we don't play, the owners are still going to get paid by the TV contract. Was it four billion dollars that they were supposed to get paid? and then the courts decided that they were not going to get that revenue. Do you feel that that played a role in, in where we are right now in the lockout? And if you can explain that deal that was in the contract. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take that just very briefly. At least, at least for a moment, uh, Judge Doty, who's been managing the, the, the football collective bargaining agreement in, in SSA for the last uh, 17 years, I believe, uh, declared that the owners couldn't receive their money that certainly took away some of the economic incentive toward locking out as a, as, a, as a matter of coercion. And I think you'd actually describe the NFL players, or the NFL's lockout at this point was more responsive as opposed to uh, offensive, I guess I would describe it to you in that way. It wasn't a theory they were using to coerce, they were using it now just to cap their damages in that construct. So it may explain why we aren't quite, at, quite as a, at hot a war as we might be otherwise. Chelsea? Back to the NBA CBA, um, as I understand and from what I've gotten from Professor Boland in class, um, <laughs> um, the, uh, the formation of super teams seems kind of like a non-issue um, with the new contract, with the new CBA. I just wanted to know why. Okay. Does the formation of super teams, is it a non-issue with the current CBA? You know, I think we make a, a, a pretty big deal of this um, super teams. Um, but, but I can remember when um, uh, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, and Jerry West played on the same team. That was back in the 60s. And they didn't win a championship every year. Um, as a matter of fact, I think the only one won. So I, I don't think that that's something that will uh, determine or decide that we need to legislate against. 
um, you know, more than two superstars playing on one team. I, I, re I really don't think that's a big issue. Leanne? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I actually have a two-part question relating to the decertification and the NLRB. So first, you know, what do we think the likelihood is that the NLRB says that they weren't allowed to certify, uh, decertify? in the first place, and secondly, assuming they make that determination, which I'm sure is going to be years down the road, how do you envision that affecting the labor and the CBA's negotiations going forward? Frank, you even offered on this one before, so what do you, do you, do you think that the NLRB will overturn the, the decertification in this case? Uh, I'm not a labor lawyer. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> what do you think? I don't think so. You don't think so? No. Look, I, the problem is it's the same trick play. If it were a new trick play, I'd agree 100% and without thinking about it. Um, but I just don't know. There's well, certainly a lot. There's certainly some risk in decertifying, though. Generally, mm -hmm. that you 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 don't, you don't necessarily have the right to recertify. You 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 take some peril in that. There, all the union benefits are are gone. So that it isn't. It, it, once you've run it, it is, it is a trick play. Now people know, I guess, is a fair one in that one. Yeah. Well, I think it's too early to determine that it's a trick play. Uh, it could be 20 or 30 years from now if you successfully maneuvered around this situation. But I think this Supreme Court was pretty clear. David? This can relate to all, all the leagues. Um, but with the, just the overall level of economic uncertainty in our economy today, um, I can see this as a way of maybe possibly, uh, depending on the terms of the CBA, uh, how owners may want to have a shorter term CBA until more certainty is, is found. Just wondering generally overall in each of the leagues, how is the, the overall, the, the, the gorilla in the, the room, the elephant in the room, the, the economic situation in the country impacting the uh, collective bargaining negotiations? If so, how? Well, I mean, I, th I think when you look at sports, one thing you have to consider is the role that TV is playing in all this. And for as much uncertainty and volatility as there's been in the economy, um, you know, the TV ratings are going, I mean, t TV programming in, in sports is still going gangbusters. So it's not quite a, as sort of as perilous as other, uh, as other industries. But we, I mean, I, 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 I'm with you that uh, I think you need these, you need these opt-outs just given new... Not, not, I mean, the, the flip side, too. I mean, you, you have the, the economic downturn, but you also could, could find new revenue streams tomorrow. Um, but, I mean, you, you, you were saying what, five, five or six years? Well, I still believe that's the five or six years because I think that gives stability to ownership. And I think uh, players like the security, that they know that the contract they sign will be honored. It'd be a five-year deal or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but I do think the economic uh, conditions in this particular time did affect collective bargaining agreement. I mean, let's face it, the multi-billionaires who own teams uh, suffered their assets, right. suffered in parts other than ownership of a and, franchise. And, and the facilities, and, too. And, and, uh, yeah, and as a result of that, combined with the lack of public financing for stadiums, clearly generated from a standpoint of uncertainty that uh, one, some of these owners had said, look, 20% of my assets are gone over here. Let me take a closer look at this football team that I own. And then as I take a closer look, I say, we're paying players what? I don't believe it. Let's take another look at that. John and, John and Wayne? I, I still think what you're looking at from, from baseball's perspective is, this is Michael Wiener's first collective bargaining agreement, and this technically could be Bud Selig's last. I, I'm going on limb and say this is probably gonna be a four or five year deal. Uh, I don't think that they're probably gonna go with the opt-out clause, uh, but I think what's gonna be a big telltale for baseball this year is if they can eclipse the 80 million plateau in attendance. I think that's what will drive a lot of people. Granted, we are seeing some major economic factors in our backyard here with, with the Mets and in particular with the Dodgers as well. I think that's a, a major issue for the sport. I, I think, most importantly, they really have to tighten up their debt service rule. Uh, they have to really manage their assets and liabilities a little bit better because I think they got lax in a lot of instances. But I think for this CBA, from a baseball perspective, you're probably looking at about a four or five year deal uh, locked in from that perspective because both sides want to get this done. And also it's a legacy piece for Seal Lake and it's a new piece for Wiener going forward. 
Um, I think that this is going to end up being a short-term deal because the two new leaders aren't going to be, neither one's going to be all that happy with it. Um, and um, so it'll be shorter than it should be. Um, you know, these things should be six years long. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about the 06 CBA is there was a new um, provision that was put in that basically gave you additional cap room if uh, league-wide cash spending wasn't at certain levels. No one realized for a couple of years how that was going to work. You need the actual experience. And so the more complex these deals become, and they need to be more complex to be equitable, um, the longer they need to be. Gentlemen? I take that as our last question. 2011 is unquestionably going to be, if not a year of crisis, it's going to be a year of great change and uncertainty in, in our sports. And I want to thank our panelists for being so extraordinary in, in, their, in their views and their discussion tonight. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening. So please give them a big hand and a rousing warm applause.